Hey YouTube, JP Dillon. What you're looking at here is the chassis out of a late 50s silver tone 21 inch uh, console set. This one goes back a while. Uh, I have a link to the original video in the description. Long and short of it is, this was kind of a housewarming gift that was given to me and it had a good CRT so I figured, eh, why not? Need another TV like I need a hole in the head, but it was a gift. And so I went with it. I replaced uh, the selenium rectifiers, added a bigger dropping resistor, recapped it, and was greeted with a picture that was more or less unusable. Uh, there was no phase lock. It was rolling from side to side. Uh, it w had no video response or whatever. And after much time of troubleshooting and replacing all those little mica mold capacitors, I discovered that the... Uh, horizontal oscillator and phase transformer here had been dicked with by somebody and the one of the cores that deals with the phase lock had literally been turned so far in that it had fallen inside of the transformer uh, and so I had to take the transformer apart which is why you can see the sides are kind of tweaked and uh, reset the core and then dial it in so then we got a picture and we had good phase lock now but we're to the point where the video response is still crummy. If I try to align the, for video response, I lose sound. Uh, I've tried a sub or tuner, and that helps marginally, but not enough. So I'm at to the point where I'm just frustrated with the IF section in this thing, and so I'm going to turn it into a composite monitor. So the purpose of this video today is to show you how to convert your vintage black and white TV uh, to a composite monitor uh, so you can avoid the hassle of a worn out IF strip. It probably has some silver mica disease. They're not tuning well enough. Whatever the reason may be that you're just frustrated with it. So let's go over things that you need in order to make this happen. The first thing you need to do is know what type of set you have, whether it's a line operated set or a transformer operated set. This is very important. Uh, you want a transformer operated set for simplicity because a line operated set operates anywhere from 70 to 120 volts off ground and there's a good chance that whatever you connect to it uh, <clears throat> is probably going to get cooked. And yeah, you can use isolation methods through capacitors. Uh, it's actually better to use an isolation transformer, uh, either a ground loop isolator for one to one ratio, or just put the, an isolation transformer in front of the thing. Second thing you'll want is your SAMs. Uh, I don't care what people say or how good you think you are. I've been doing this for almost 20 years, and I will tell you, you got to have the SAMs. Uh, the SAMs tells you things like your video amp location, what tube it is, what the pinout is, what desired input signal that video amp stage wants. And it varies. Uh, usually the de facto composite standard is 1 volt peak to peak with a 75 ohm impedance. Uh, but some, like that Central Carlson I worked on a while back, wants 2 volts peak to peak which you can kind of get away with, uh, but perhaps not that well. Um, so if it requires more than two volts peak to peak, you really need to make a preamp stage, which is a whole other hassle in itself. And then it's also helpful, but not crucial to know your, the sync type, whether it's positive or negative sync pulses. Uh, most sets use negative sync pulses. The composite uses negative sync pulses. Uh, some sets use positive, which is weird, but uh, in that case you'll have to make an inversion circuit, which is complicated because it causes loss and problems with synchronization. And then, of course, you want your surface mount RCA jacks and well-shielded coax cable in a location to put it all. So let's take a look at the back of our set and see where we're going to toss this stuff. So here's the back of the set. And you can see they already have an input for the sound for your they label it as phonograph or radio. So we could really just drill another small hole here and put another RCA jack in for the video and then feed that up to the uh, video amplifier tube, which uh, in all honesty, I don't remember which one this is. And I don't have a tube chart diagram. So again, the SAMS is helpful. Uh, these IF transformers are all made by automatic. Uh, I believe they're automatic. Maybe they're uh, merits, I think they're the prefix here, the 119, that's something automatic uses. 
Uh, these probably all have silver mica disease. None of them tune worth a shit. Uh, they're just all in really rough shape. Um, also, the yoke is starting to crumble on this one. I just have it kind of glued in the spot that it works. So I don't really want to spend a lot of money on this set. I've already got too much time invested in it. I just want it to work. Uh, so uh, basically what I'm going to do is just drill this hole out here so that we can install our other RCA jack. And then we'll take a look at the SAMs and we'll figure out where the video amplifier is, what the grid control grid pin is, and what it's looking for as far as input level signal and all that sort of mess. So um, let's drill this out and then let's get to looking at the SAMs. All right, so here it is. I took the original one, the original phenolic out, because obviously it was too big, and I just drilled a second hole here. Uh, so this will be the audio jack, uh, which already exists, which goes up to that switch there at the front panel, to switch between TV audio and phono audio, which doesn't cut off the picture, so that'll be nice. Uh, and then this will just go to our video amp stage. So when you put the backpack on, uh, you're really not gonna notice much. I don't really care much for the sound on this TV anyways. So I'll probably just leave that there as an option if I have to have it, uh, or I'll just run the sound through another amplifier of some kind. So uh, there's our placement. Uh, now the next thing is, is figuring out where I'm going to attach this video link to, and uh, if I have adequate signal and all that. So we'll get a printout of the SAMs, which I have on file, and we'll take a look at the uh, <clears throat> the video amplifier stage and see what's necessary to make that happen. All right, so here's our SAMs. Uh, this is number 292 uh, Fuller 10, I think. Uh, anyway, here's your video amp circuit. You've got your 6A N8. And as you can see, what they're looking for is 1 volt peak to peak at 30 hertz. That's your low frequency response. Better low frequency response equals better video. Um, let's see if we can zoom in here, make it a little bit better. So uh, it looks like the control grid is on pin 8. The cathode is on pin 9, which goes through the uh, contrast control to ground. 7 is your screen grid, and 6 is your plate. The way that this works is, is the contrast control is a variable resistor to the cathode and as you ground, as the cathode gets closer to ground the gain of the video amplifier increases. So, um, now we may have to play with this a little bit but really you want to inject your signal right at the grid and then use the contrast control to vary the amplification. Now if it's not enough gain, uh, then we might have to, the, the control grid might be getting loaded down and we'll have to incorporate a, a divider network to, to change the input impedance for that. And then as you can see the output goes through that trap there and then goes uh, to the uh, control grid on the, or cathode on the CRT. The brightness works with the, uh, or no, the brightness works with the control grid. I'm seeing things different. Anyway, um, so yeah, we got to inject our signal right at the control grid, which we'll do with a piece of cat uh, coax. It's a 6AN8. Sorry for the jerkiness there. And uh, then we'll obviously, we'll have to cut, excuse me, we'll have to cut the uh, video detector signal here and just go right into the video amplifier. Uh, and then power it on and see uh, what happens. Okay, so here's our video amplifier. It's the 6AN8. It's the only 6AN8 in the set. <laughs> it's right after the, uh, the third IF amplifier here and detector. Uh, so this is what we're going to look at here. Let's spin this around real quick. So here's the back of the 6AN8. And the way that you're going to count the tube sockets, uh, I believe the uh, this is pin one, you go in a clockwise rotation. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
and then uh, 9. So here's that one make resistor that we were looking at on the schematic diagram, uh, which then goes back to the video detector. So this pin here, uh, this is where you would want to attach your video signal, right at pin 8. And then there's a nearby ground lug here, which is really handy, because then we can just ground our coax right to that point, uh, and then uh, feed the cable down through the chassis, down to the floor uh, of the cabinet, and then out to our RCA jacks over here. Sounds simple, right? But the question is, is will it actually work once we put it into place? So the first thing we need to do is we need to cut pin 8, uh, which is your control grid pin, and we need to attach our video signal here, route the cable, ground it, and then fire this bad boy up with a video source and see uh, what it looks like. Alright, so here it is, all wired up. We've got our ground attached and we've got our coax hot lead attached to pin 8 which is our control grid and then I'm feeding that down to the input RCA jack here. So really the only thing left is to uh, plug it in and fire it up. So let's see what happens. Alright, so here we go. We've got our DTB box hooked up via composite to our RCA jacks here. We've got a basic speaker hooked up to the TV. Let's see what it does. This has been sitting for a long time, so I uh, assume there's going to be problems. Let's find out. This thing usually warms up pretty fast. Yeah, there we go. Now oh, we had sync for a little bit there. <laughs> uh, now you got to remember that previously I was fighting with almost no sync signal whatsoever. Let me move this aside. It just got broken. Whoops. I've got more bottoms. I'm not worried about it. Okay. So now we're going to come back here to our horizontal frequency control. And see if we can't dial this in a little bit better. Oh, it's getting close. Uh, there we go. There we go. Okay. So we've got a picture. Let's see if I can make it lose sync the other way. And then I can kind of dial it in that way. You want to make it so that the midpoint of the horizontal hold control kind of locks everything in. All right. So we've got a, a dim picture. Ah, there we go. There's our contrast. There's our brightness. Not bad. This picture tube uh, isn't great at focus. We can definitely see there's a little bit of a, a fuzziness around it. Interesting. So when I turn the sound on, I lose my video. Isn't that weird? Amazing opportunities and amazing ways. Ah, they're probably doing that so that it uh, doesn't burn up the CRT with an image. We'll have to disable that. That's easy enough to do. But anyway, uh, you can see that we have pretty decent, a pretty decent picture. Before, basically, I just had a smeary mess of garbage. Uh, we obviously still need to work on the height and all that sort of thing. Uh, but this will give you an idea of what's required to get a composite video input into your vintage TV. Uh, basically, study the machine. It wants about a volt peak to peak, at least this one does. You can get away with a machine that wants two volts peak to peak, although you'll be turning the contrast control way up for a decent picture. Uh, but otherwise, it looks pretty good. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is finish setting up the geometry and uh, 
call this one done. So very likely the next video you'll see of this one is me working on the cabinet. And uh, what I'm going to do next is disable that uh, circuit that kills the video when you switch over to sound, which shouldn't be too tricky. Anyway, thanks for watching the video, guys. More stuff to come soon.